Saro. Here we are at MasonicCon 2017. Uh, you're here with us right now. Uh, you just gave an awesome lecture on um, the hidden messages in Masonic architecture. Um, and you've written a, at least two books. I think maybe uh, you've written another one or just the, the, the two? The two that I talk about mostly are written in stone yeah, and missing. the missing link. Yeah. And um, so anyways, Let's just get right into it. Um, you have an archaeological background. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've always been interested in archaeology. I've, I've mostly been interested in ancient cultures and the, uh, the parallels and the similarities that ancient cultures share that, uh, that a lot of archaeologists and anthropologists in the past five or six decades have largely been ignoring, in my opinion. Um, you know, I was told by my college professors 25 years ago that the idea of Atlantis or any type of a, an ancient, advanced civilization that uh, that's so old it's been forgotten is a is not a, is pseudoscience. It's not accepted in academia, and so that didn't really jive with me because most of my interest and most of my research shows that a lot of these ancient cultures were in fact connected. So about 25 years ago, I went on my own kind of quest, my own personal quest. Not necessarily an academic quest, but a personal quest. And I traveled, and I spoke with scholars and archaeologists and professors, and I read books on the subject. And what I found was um, all these ancient cultures all actually shared the same architecture, the same traditions, and in fact, the same religion. And the parallels in the architecture show parallels in the religion is what I found. Um, ancient China, ancient India, Europe, uh, in the Americas, you have the Inca and pre-Inca cultures in Peru, and the, uh, in Mexico, the Maya, the Aztec. All these ancient cultures around the world had so many parallels, it's incredible. And my research shows, and I've been researching it now for probably 30 years, or in earnest, 30 years, shows that they all had the same wisdom doctrine, they all shared the same religion, they all believed in the same you know, eternal life of the soul, life after death, and they expressed it in the same art and architecture. Uh, one of the things I found is they all built what I call triptych temples, three door temples with the door in the middle taller and wider than the outer two flanking it. So these triptych temples are found in all ancient civilizations and they're also found in Freemasonry and other secret societies. And another one that I talked about in today's lecture is the, the God itself icon. Again, found in all ancient civilizations and inherited in Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. We saw the rebus with the holding the the, the, uh, the compass on the, on the right hand and the square on the left hand. That's that's the modern manifestation of the ancient worldwide God self icon. So, not only have I found these parallels among ancient cultures, but I'm actually showing how Freemasonry has been a storehouse for these symbols: the God self icon, the triptych, and there's other symbols that I talk about as well. Well, not in the lecture, but in the book, like the Flor de Lis symbol, mm -hmm. another triptych symbol, mm -hmm. the Triketra, again, another triptych symbol. And so, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a lifelong interest. Sure. So, how did this journey of yours uh, to discover these, you know, archaeological secrets, how did that lead you to Freemasonry? How did you become a Freemason as a result? You know, it was actually, I had found the triptych first. I didn't know, I had never heard of Freemasonry. We're in the mid-90s now, 1995, 1996. And uh, I was noticing the triptych among ancient cultures. And then I started to notice it in modern buildings. And I thought to myself, it seems that whoever's, whoever's building and encoding this triptych in these modern buildings knows about this ancient worldwide triptych parallel. And then one day I was in New York City in front of Rockefeller Center and they have that massive triptych where they put up the Christmas tree every year. And I saw it had the God symbol in the middle and the male and female symbols in the left and right and the God had a compass. And I remembered, actually that led me to Freemasonry, was the fact that he had that compass in his hand. I started to read books on Masonry and I learned that the Freemasons are an esoteric building society, you know, society of builders, and obviously the builders of these ancient temples were builders like the Masons, they were, you know, master Masons. Mm -hmm. So I started making the connection that way. It was really that, that Rockefeller Center uh, aha moment, I call it, where I saw him holding that compass and I, I link the compass to free, the Freemasons movement, um, and that's that's how it started. Okay. So now we have these secrets that are hidden within the architecture, and they're kind of refuted by you know uh, 
mainstream academia. Um, can you talk a little bit in, as to what it's, it would appear that the original intent of Freemasonry was to share this with the brothers, you know, within, within the brotherhood. And now it seems to have been, you know, expelled from the craft itself. So, can you talk a little bit about that as to why that might be, whether it was deliberate or accidental or maybe a blend of both? Yeah, I, I believe that. And I, and I talk about the fact that I believe that um, I, modern Masonry, modern Freemasonry today is not what it was when it first started. In my opinion, modern Masonry has been changed. It went through an unwilling transformation probably in the mid-1800s. I actually tie it to the Morgan Affair. I believe that during the Morgan Affair, the true wisdom, the true ancient wisdom from Freemasonry was pulled from the order. Um, and the Morgan Affair was a, was a major upset in, in American Freemasonry. I mean, we're, not ta we're talking about several decades, as you know. Um, and I'm putting it together now. It's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. But I think one can clearly see a kind of red flag operation in that, in that 1830s to 1870s whole conflagration of Freemasonry and the shutting of the lodges and the um, you know, the whole thing, the third anti-Masonic party in the U.S., that whole thing did something. I think Masonry was changed in that period. And I think a lot of the true wisdom, a lot of the ancient wisdom that was in Freemasonry was pulled out at that time. Like I said, the wires were crossed, the teachings were co-opted, and, uh, and I think a lot of the wisdom that was in Freemasonry was pulled by and being used by what I call the big corporations. Now you see it in their advertising, their marketing. They have these Masonic symbols, the pentagram. A lot of them use a lot of different Masonic symbols. And so that's, that's what I see happening with Masonry. Do you think it could have been a response to the Morgan Affair in the sense that, you know, Morgan was threatening to reveal Masonic secrets. So as a response, you know, well, we can't let this happen, you know, so we have to kind of pull, we have to kind of water down Masonry so this threat will never arise again. Well, is it more sinister? And then it's like, you know, well, there's access to a higher level of consciousness that we can um, use to manipulate people. Right. And so we want to take this away because too many people are gaining access to this. Well, that's what it is. You know, the true authentic teachings of Freemasonry empower a human being with the strength of their own spirituality mm -hmm. and once you're empowered once you recognize your, who you are what once you become that unmovable force you're no longer swayed by advertising on television and you're no longer uh, a sucker really for a lot of their pitches you know mm -hmm. a lot of and their pitches are spend your life working and making money so that you can be like your neighbor and have, have all the toys and all the great... Sure, we all like having good things, sure, but there's a balance and, we, and I think especially in, in the West, in America, we've pitched it to you know, a, a culture of consumption where most people lose their entire lives just to be able to say I make a lot of money or I buy things. We've, we've kind of you know, gotten off to the deep end here. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the reason why they pulled this true wisdom from Freemasonry is so they could pitch their products and pitch their lifestyle to the American, uh, unknowing American mindset. And the unknowing American mindset just buys it all. But pharmaceuticals, buy it. You know, higher gas prices, buy it. Mm -hmm. Just take it. There's no... Uh, Federal Reserve inflating the currency and you know uh, depreciating our savings. You know, basically, it's been theft through uh, money manipulation, right. and people don't notice because they're too busy, you know, trying to chase after the material. Thing. That's it. You know what? And so they pulled it. That's why risk allowing a George Washington to rise up against the big corporations like he rose up against mm -hmm. the British Crown? Mm -hmm. Why risk allowing an authentic Freemason like Andrew Jackson to pull down the banking system the way he pulled mm -hmm. down the Second Bank of the U.S. on the grounds that that made the rich richer. Mm -hmm. These were real authentic Freemasons. They were the real deal. And they, you know, if you look at their lives, they they had extraordinary lives. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that in part it's because of the wisdom of Freemasonry. They, they were able to, um, you know, act from the center. You know, they, they were truly uh, realized human beings. And not just those two. A lot of Masons throughout history had that, you know. And that's the reason, because they were exposed to this higher consciousness that you're talking about through the teachings of Freemasonry. I think that's what's missing in the order.
you think that's part of why nowadays the trend in uh, academia is to look upon our founding fathers, you know, like uh, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin, in a more disparaging point of view? Like, you know, when we were, we were kids, they were kind of deified almost as you know the pillars of American freedom and you know. Uh, De democratic republicanism, you know, uh, as sort of freedom, you know, the bastions of freedom. Yeah. So now we look at them much more disparagingly, the more negative parts of their life story, that's what we focus on, and we kind of look at them more as villains now than heroes. Do you think that that's part of it too, to downplay the... It could be. Yeah. I, I believe I'm starting to see a lot, you know, they might be maneuvering to try to make, you know, Freemasonry, that those brothers are all devil worshippers, mm -hmm. child uh, sacrificers. Yeah. You're always going to get that. You'll always have that. Um, but the, the idea is to educate the public and to make sure that the public is uh, aware that it's a storied institution. I think what this idea that uh, they're trying to make the presidents and, and famous Masons out to be not as great as they were, that might be the, the mm -hmm. beginning of a campaign mm -hmm. of anti-Masonic, you know, anti I'm not sure, but it's a possibility. Yeah. But even if it's not necessarily anti-Mason, anti-free thinking, you know, or, you know, critical thinking. Right. It seems like there's a lot of that sentiment nowadays. You know, if you, you employ any sort of critical thinking whatsoever towards anything that's in the, you know, the public lexicon. You're deemed a conspiracy theorist or a crackpot or you wear a tinfoil hat. Just for asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's like through social engineering they're trying to scare people from being who they are. They're trying to scare them from not conforming with the crowd. Mm -hmm. You know, you have... I believe that's very true, especially in American society. You know, they, they want you to conform. Mm -hmm. They they want you to fear nonconformity because the minute that they know that you're nonconforming, well, hey, this guy's thinking for himself now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we got right. a dangerous individual here, mm -hmm. right? yeah. and that's what masonry does. You know, the authentic teachings of masonry make you an open-minded person. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, you can measure somebody's intelligence by the amount of open-mindedness they have. That's, in my opinion, the measure of an intelligent person. Right. The level, of, the degree of open-mindedness, not gullibility, yep. where they believe everything they read or see. Sure. Open-mindedness, understanding from both sides what this is about, and keeping an open mind and saying, okay, you know, this, what's possible, what's not, what's mm -hmm. probable, what's not, and taking it from there. I, I detect from you, know, I've seen a couple of your lectures, I've read your first book, and I haven't read the second one yet, can wait for it in hard copy, but uh, what I detect from it is that, that you, there's a spirit of um, open-mindedness, that you invite, you know, the people to challenge your work, you know, and you face it head on, and you're not asking people to adopt your, your your hypothesis per se, but just to entertain it and to think about it, and, you know, and that's so... Uh, it's so apparent that it's missing from public discourse these days, where people can't just express different points of view, and you know, we may not agree, but you can speak your mind and I can just let it be, and you, you know? Totally, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, I agree. Yeah. It just seems like if you disagree with somebody, it automatically means you hate them. Or, yeah, right, automatically exactly. some type of confrontation, not at all. I like it when people challenge me on right, stuff, you yeah. know why? And this is the truth, honestly. When you know you when you're researching something and you know you've got it, right? You know you found the truth or what you think is the truth. Every kind of check, you know, somebody will challenge you on something, mm -hmm. you'll look for evidence mm -hmm. to say, well, maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong, let's take a look. Yeah. You'll always find evidence in your favor, and, and it's very blatant, and that's what I like to do. When somebody challenges, that's good. It gives me an opportunity to say, all right, let's get more powerful research. You know? a, lot of the, a lot of the material that I have is based on the fact that years ago people challenged me. Mm -hmm. And so I put, I found the quote where the guy says this, sure. thing, or I found the, you know, the, the picture where it's shows Giordano Bruno's Grand Master Certificate with a male and a sun and a female and the moon. You know? yep. And so you could see it's not just me talking, it's, it's backed by information, it's backed by facts. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things I find most remarkable about your work is that it's, you support your arguments with so much evidence. You know, there's just so many photographs of things that you, you know, you've seen in your journeys or you know, in your studies. Uh, 
to prove time and time again the similarities. So even someone who might not agree with your hypothesis can at least entertain it and understand. You, you know what I mean? So, and this, yeah. is, this is a rational person presenting uh, a worthy argument for me to consider. It may not, it may not be my, you know, I may not agree with it, but this gentleman has done his work, he's yeah. done his homework, and you really uh, do an outstanding job with that. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I try hard, yeah. and, and it's very, very difficult. You know, you really got to get that perfect quote or that perfect photo. Yeah. But you know what? When I wrote the book, I kept thinking, I'm. It's like I'm a lawyer and I'm trying to prove this, but mm -hmm. to be before a jury. Mm -hmm. And I have to build up a strong enough case that at the end I win the case. Sure. And that's the way I looked at that book and also my second book, The Missing Link. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to build a case here that the person that reads it understands why I believe so passionately in this. Yeah. And again, like you said, I, I always tell people, look, this is my research. I'm not, by any means, I don't want you to be convinced. Do your own research, sure. follow up on it, you know. Spend time when you see something, you know, write it down, jot it down, whatever. Mentally take a note of it. Remember what I said about mm -hmm. it. You'll start putting the pieces together also, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's a fun thing to do. So, have you found the resistance to your work? If you, when, when you meet it, when you meet resistance to your work uh, or cr criticism of it, is it more harsh within the Masonic world or from the academic world? It's pretty harsh both in both worlds, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, that's the sad part, because I, I, I look at my work as a, I really present a lot of facts, mm -hmm. and I travel to these places, and I take video, and I take photos, and I study the history, and, mm -hmm. you know, I work so hard to really be impeccable at my work, and then for the academics, they look at it and they say, this is pseudoscience, mm -hmm. you're a pseudoscientist, it's not even worthy of our attention. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you have Masons who, uh, m most of them are not esoteric minded. Some of them are, mm -hmm. but most, the majority aren't. So a lot of them will look at that and say, not sure where you got that from, but it has nothing to do with Masonry. Mm -hmm. So it's tough, you know. It's, yeah. it, those are two worlds that should have an open mind toward this stuff, but unfortunately don't. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, it is because, you know, I'm, you know, I, this is what I'm interested in, and so I'm trying to find an audience. I want to reach an audience that is willing to have an open mind, and that I think, you know, for example, Masons they should be interested in this. You know, mm -hmm. that's what the fraternity is about. I explain the symbolism. You know, look mm -hmm. at all the symbols. It all makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's there, and you know, um, I, went, I gave a lecture last last weekend in New York City, and a guy jumped up, and he was offended. He said, "What is this? What What are you talking about? This is not, I, I object to this lecture." I was surprised. Wow. So was everybody. Everybody was surprised. And he wouldn't sit down. They actually had to physically take him, wow. walk him to the door, open the door, and throw him. Wow. <laughs> but wow. you know what? He was a Mason. He'd never heard of any of this before. Yeah. He didn't agree with it. And you know, he felt that he had to speak up. And so that's where we are in Masonry today. You're, you're a Masonic rabble rouser. <laughs> <laughs> I hope in 20 years it'll be different. But then again, I joined 17 years ago. It's changing, you know, because now you have the younger crowd who are coming in who are interest, more, more interested in the esoteric. Not all of them, but you know, some of them. Mm -hmm. I'm a new Mason, so I, I can't say definitively, but I wager that you probably wouldn't see like, an event like Masonic Con when you first got into Masonry. Right, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think things are changing, you know, from my limited perspective, the short time I've been involved in it. But I'm glad you brought up the point about the, what Masons should be concerned with this. Can, can you explain why they should be concerned with this? Like, what can a Mason expect if you were to employ some of uh, the philosophy that you've uncovered? You know? Well, I can tell you from my own life, you know, I, I've changed dramatically from when I, I know we all have, as grown-ups, you know, we're different than we were when we were in our early 20s mm -hmm. or late teens. But I mean, for me, it's just been a life-changing experience. I've grown, I've managed to grow in incredible ways, you know. It's calmed me down, made me more intellectually minded, you know. Uh, made me want to read more, travel more, and, you know, took some of the angst out of my, you know, angry kid kind of thing, you know, took that out. Um, by employing the principle, the philosoph philosophical approaches that you've learned about. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, look at the check. Just to give you an idea, the checkerboard floor. Mm -hmm. You know, in my research, that's like the yin and yang. You know, mm -hmm. the black square. You could look at it in so many different ways, but one of the ways I like to look at it when I'm having a bad day is, it's one of those black square days. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what those. The whole checkerboard floor is the black and the white, the good and the bad. You mm -hmm. know. 
each one of those squares is like a day. You're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days. Mm -hmm. and, and when you accept, you have to accept that you're going to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, you know, because without those bad days, you wouldn't have good days, you know, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, you know, it's almost like uh, it's, it's been a calming and a... Uh, you know, balancing force in my life in, in many ways, but that's just one way, you know, mm -hmm. that's just one way. You know, using the symbols and, and um, th there's a whole magical aspect also to Freemasonry mm -hmm. that I wouldn't talk about here, mm -hmm. you know, that goes even for, you know, the stuff that I'm even bringing to the table is even superficial stuff mm -hmm. compared to some of the deeper stuff that you sure. learn about in, for example, on Crowley, the Golden Dawn and that type of stuff. Sure. And you just, you can take it a lot further, but I mean, coming to these lodges and talking about that stuff here is almost like suicide. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> baby steps, baby steps, baby steps yeah, right. exactly. But you know, you talk about um, the good and dark, the black and the white, you know, the moon and the sun, and balancing, finding equilibrium. Like, why is that so important? And, and what? What, what can you, you expect when you achieve that equilibrium? You know, it's, it, all the ancient cultures all talked about this duality, that we live in a world of yins and yangs, and everything falls into that category. And so what it is really is you have to recognize, and I, I look at it like, have you ever gotten hit in the head with like a ball or a punch or something, but you really got your bell rung, mm -hmm. and everything is kind of like yeah. going back and forth, and you're like, wait, it's kind of like that. And there are two sides, and you have to put the two sides together and then step back and you'll see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. We only see things through the one side, and we have to learn to see through the dark side. We have the light side. In our culture, we're taught about the light. Everything good, do be good, everything good. But there's a dark side, too, mm -hmm. that we have to learn to embrace. The two sides of the one coin. Mm -hmm. It's not just the one side, it's both sides. Right. And according to this teaching, according to this concept of balancing the opposites, we have to uh, reach out and, it's almost like reaching out across the abyss, but reach out and come to know our own dark side. Mm -hmm. Take that information and sublimate it, um, make it a part of who we are consciously. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, not just unconsciously, that's where it is, it's in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Um, I probably should give a lot of good examples that just aren't coming to me right now, but as an example, we all as children suffer some type of traumatic experience. I mean, being a, growing up is a traumatic experience, but we all have things in our childhood that have happened to us that shape the adult we become. And in this way of reaching out into the dark and, and finding things about yourself that you didn't even know about, you can almost heal things like a childhood injury or some type of thing. And you can learn why you are the way you are because of that event in your childhood. And so when you start looking at the dark side of yourself, not just the light side, because you know about your good point. We all know the good stuff. Yeah. It's the dark stuff we don't want anyone to see and including ourselves. Mm -hmm. We what we do is we say, That guy, he's the jerk, not me. Yeah. He's the that guy's see her, she did something. Mm -hmm. Whenever you point the finger, people are pointing at you because you're the one that did that. In some way, it's you. And you have to find out the things that are happening in the world on the outside are a reflection of your inner imbalances. Mm -hmm. And so when something is no, a, a big problem in the material world is really reflecting a big problem in the inner world. Mm -hmm. And when you get rid of that inner problem, that outer world problem will go away as well. So that's what, you know, that's the extent this really goes deep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these symbols, talking about the symbolism just scratches the surface. Sure. It's, it's kind of like a primer, a beginner's course. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's, just, it's such a remarkable uh, body of work. It truly is. You know, I, I follow your updates when you email them out and stuff or whatever you're on Facebook and you put something up and it's like I'm really happy for you that you're pursuing this, you know, your life's passion. You know, thank you. It's a, it's a remarkable thing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Alright, so I, got, I, I don't really have anything else other than if people want to research your, you know, your work and like, you know, find out who you are and what you're all about, how should they do that? You know, richardcassaro.com, my website. Um, I have social media pages on that website. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a woman came to me and said, I, Goog I went to Google Images and I put your name in and I saw all your work right there. Yeah. So I think that's not a bad idea, too. If you go to Google Images and just type in my name, just to get a broad overview, you can see a lot of the stuff that I put online. But richardcassauer.com is the best way to read the, the articles and 
passages from the book. All right, awesome. Terrific. All right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, hope we will see you soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.